Hello, and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. It's the show where we explore the spooky, the unexplained, and the unbelievable and try to find an answer. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. And today we're talking about D.B. Cooper. Dat Bitch Cooper? <laughs> That's right, yes. The initial stand for Dat Bitch Cooper. Dat Bitch. Okay. No, D.B. Cooper, or the uh, the Norjack case, as the FBI called it, remains the only unsolved case of air piracy in history. Air piracy? Yes, the only time an airliner was hijacked, um, and the case was never solved. Nobody knows who this man was. Well, maybe they do, oh. and maybe they don't. Okay, well, tell me about it. All right. So here's, you, you want the overview? Yes, please. Let me give you the part you already know. Mm -hmm. A man named Dan, a man calling himself mm -hmm. Dan Cooper, hijacked a Boeing 727 on its way from Portland to Seattle on Wednesday, November 24th, 1971. He extorted a $200,000 ransom. That is about $1.26 million in today money. Mm -hmm. And he jumped out of the airplane um uh, somewhere on a flight south to uh towards reno and uh yeah he 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 leapt out of the plane and uh, was never seen again absconded into the night with the money now i'm going to assume he had some sort of parachute pa okay yes yeah because i was gonna say yeah if he just jumped out i doubt he would be seen again uh yeah, well it's funny you say that because it's it's a well we'll get to it anyway oh. uh he did jump with a parachute though okay but let me set the scene for you here, Caroline. Please do. It's November 24th, 1971. Mm -hmm. It's Thanksgiving Eve. Uh, and we are at Portland International Airport. Now, which Portland is this? Uh, Oregon. Okay. As opposed to Maine? Yeah, I didn't know if it was a cross-country type of thing Oh, I see. Not. No, this is only a 30-minute flight. Wow, what's the point? <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, <laughs> Rich people. So Northwest Orient Airlines is the uh, is the airline we're talking about here. They are no longer in business. No, really? Um, I don't think any company with the word Orient in its name is still in business, is it? Probably a good thing. Uh, so well, Oriental Trading. Here you go. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> so a man in his mid forties, um, with a, with a pretty nondescript face. There are, uh, of course, very famous FBI uh, composite sketches of Dan Cooper. If anybody wants to uh, uh, take a look, we'll throw them up on the website. But uh, there's a good chance you've seen him before. This is a very nondescript middle-aged face. He's a guy who looked like he was in about his mid-40s. Uh, and he was wearing a business suit with a white shirt and a black tie uh, and carrying a black suitcase. Now, this is pre-9-11. Did you even need any identification to do interstate well uh, intercountry travel uh international travel i'm not sure about but he was only flying from, right yeah from uh, uh oregon to washington so from what i understand it used to be extremely lax so yeah i don't think i certainly don't think he had to show a driver's license because one would presume this man's name was not dan cooper Oh. So Dan Cooper walks up to the Northwest Orient counter, and he spends $20 in cash for a ticket on flight 305 to Seattle. It's about a 30-minute flight. Mm-hmm. Um, and he sat down in seat 18C, uh, or 18D, or 15... E, uh, depending on who you talk to. So just any seat on the plane he sat down in. <laughs> well, depending on the reports. But he definitely was in the rear part of the plane on the right side. Okay. We are sure about that. Um, this was a Boeing 727. Uh, it's about, it carries about 100, uh, 106 people. Mm -hmm. But on this day, this flight was only about a third full. So you got about 35 passengers plus Dan. And crew. And crew. Mm -hmm. uh, the flight departed on time, which was 2.50 p.m. It's the first and last time a flight has departed on time. <laughs> you might you might be right, uh, but this one got the, the, this one got up in the air, and right around three o'clock, shortly after takeoff, um, halfway into the flight, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just about. Uh, so Cooper hands a note to a flight attendant named Florence Schaffner. Okay, um, and she drops it in her purse. She doesn't open it. Was she probably thinking that this guy was asking her out or whatever? I think she definitely assumed it was the uh, yeah phone number of a of a lonely traveler. Yep. Okay. 
Um, she was sitting, by the way, uh, I think just behind him in the, there's sort of a jump seat attached to the um, aft stair. Mm-hmm. Like the door that you would have to open up to lower the stairs to uh, let people out of the plane. Well, she was sitting right behind him. Why don't they know where he was sitting? Well, she was sitting nearby because he leaned over. I see. Okay. He leaned in and said, uh, oh, Miss, I think you'd better have a look at that note. I have a bomb. In my pants. Uh, nope, as it turns out, in the briefcase. Oh, that's uh, not as fun. So she opened the note. Okay. She couldn't remember the exact wording on it, and Cooper recovered the note later. Okay. But she said it had neat capital uh, letters on it, all capital letters in a uh, felt tip pen. Mm-hmm. And the gist of the note was that there was a bomb in his briefcase. So he said, I have a bomb. And then the note said, I also still have a bomb. Yes. Yes, okay. for sure. So why, why make her read the note? Well, I think he thought he was being very sly with just passing the note. But, but when she didn't look at it, um, he's like, oh, God damn it. Okay, look, I have a bomb. And then the note just says, I have a bomb. So it's like, well, you gave me no more information. But he remained very calm. I okay. think that's that's important to note. Everyone said he was calm and cool and, and pretty polite the, this whole time. Good for him. Uh, so, so he... Um, shows her the note she looks at it it says he has a bomb in the briefcase and then he asked her to sit down in the empty seat next to him Mm. now caroline if you're a flight attendant if you're florence schaffner what do you do at this point um i would try to signal my distress to a fellow worker Mm -hmm. florence uh, sat down next to him and asked if she could see the bomb so she's probably still thinking the bomb's in his pants. She quietly asks <laughs> if she could see it. And he briefly... Can, oh, I, can, can I see it, though? Can I see your bomb? And he briefly opened... His briefcase? His briefcase. Uh, inside, Florence Schaffner claimed she saw a flash of eight red cylinders attached to wires coated in red insulation. Mm-hmm. And those wires were collect- connected to a large cylindrical battery. Okay. It's a pretty classic uh, James Bond villain bomb in a briefcase. A really bomb looking bomb. Yes. Okay. Intensely bomb looking. <laughs> um, he closed the briefcase quickly and he uh, started get- telling her his demands. He wanted $200,000 in, quote, negotiable American currency, end quote. Okay. Four parachutes, two primary and two reserve. Okay. And a fuel truck standing by in Seattle to refuel the plane as soon as it landed. Oh, okay. So, presumably, they'd bring the money to the plane, right? Because he can't have imagined that there would be enough on the plane. Right, yes. Okay. Yeah, he's holding the plane hostage for $200,000 ransom money from the airline or whoever else wants to pay him. Right. Okay, so now she has to go tell the captain or the pilot or whatever. That's right. Uh, she headed up to the pilot in the in and the co-pilot who were up in the cabin. So let's check in with the pilot. This guy's name was William Scott. Okay. And uh, Schaffner runs up to William Scott. She gives him the gives him the the good word, the bad word, and uh, bomb. Yeah, that's always a bad word on a plane. <laughs> and she uh, comes back, and Cooper is now uh, donned a pair of shades. All right. <laughs> Just, okay, sure. Now, why not? now I'm ready to give you my number. Well, it's also like she already saw your whole face. You gave her your handwriting, like she's at least seen it, even though she didn't have to, because you already told her she had a bomb, and then the note just said, you have a bomb. He gave her handwriting in all caps in a felt tip marker, which isn't how people, that's not going to look exactly like your handwriting normally, right? I don't know, my dad writes in like all caps, because he's a psycho, I guess. (laughs) That's because he's an English teacher, he's always in grading mode. Yes. He he always writes in a red pen, too, Uh, right? Yeah, that's true, that's true. Was it a red felt tip pen? Maybe this was my father. Oh, we found another Add him to the list. <laughs> Add him to the He's not old enough, unfortunately. No. Um, Damn. <laughs> 
So uh, William Scott, the the uh, captain, the pilot, calls Seattle Tacoma Airport uh, air traffic control. Mm-hmm. He gives them the whole lowdown of what's going on. Tells them about the bomb. Tells them about the demands. They call the police and the airline. God, imagine being that air traffic control person, just getting this call and being like, "Oh God, <laughs> why did I? Oh, just." It's the only day all month I smoked pot on a shift. And <laughs> Why did I take Bobby's shift? Why did I? T- oh, I'm not even supposed to be here today. Oh, <laughs> really man. not equipped to deal with this That's whole really, situation. I just started last week and I transferred from uh, Logan. And I, I, Logan? I really don't know if I'm uh, prepared for... Yeah, was Logan open then? Probably. Uh, maybe. <laughs> it's just a big transfer. So the president of Northwest Orient uh, authorized the payment of the ransom okay, and uh, gave word for all employees of the airline to comply with this guy's demands, whatever he says. Do whatever the guy says, get him off our backs. So they paid this, what is it now, $1.5 million? Uh, 200000 then, it would be about $1.26 million Two, now. Okay, so is that why Northwest Orient is out of business nowadays? I was like, that was it. That was the budget for the year. It's We're a done. big single-time payment to lose. Although usually yeah. you're hoping that the guy will get arrested and you'll sure. get to recoup this. Um, now remember, this is only a 30-minute flight. Yeah, it doesn't seem like the best flight to pick if you're like trying to negotiate things and, and stuff like that. Well, there's no negotiation. Everyone is like, yes, sir, Mr. Cooper, we'll get you everything you want. But here's the problem. Uh, all right. Hey, Carrie, I need you uh, to get uh, $200,000 and uh, a, a bunch of cops and uh, some parachutes and uh, meet me just out in the parking lot. Can we say 15 minutes? Done. Okay, but the FBI and the <laughs> SPD weren't as on top of it as you. Sorry, I just have a lot of cash and parachutes in the basement. So this plane circles the Seattle airport for two hours. Uh, the 35 other passengers on board were told there were minor technical difficulties. Oh, brother. Meanwhile, there's this fucking idiot in the back with sunglasses on and clutching his briefcase, sweating. Oh, no. no, he's not sweating. Yeah, absolutely not. He's no? he's having a great time back there. He is at this point on his uh he's probably finished his drink. As soon as he sat down, he ordered a bourbon and soda. Mm-hmm. Uh it's a bourbon and seven up by some reports, bourbon and soda by other reports. Anyway, mm-hmm. he he liked bourbon. He's sitting there uh, <laughs> either way it's bourbon. He's sitting there sipping his bourbon and uh smoking Raleigh filter tip cigarettes. Um just end to end. He smoked eight cigarettes over the course of this flight. Oh, man, back in the day, just smoking and boozing on the plane, showing ladies your bomb. So so he's having a great time back there, I think. Obviously. Cooper's having a party. Um, and as I said, everyone said he was he was pretty calm the whole time. Anyway, uh, the plane circles for two hours while uh, the Seattle police and the FBI agents got the ransom together, um, the parachutes, and, and again, a bunch of cops. Uh, now, the money. The FBI had to get from several local banks. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and they ended up with 10,000 uh, unmarked $20 bills. Okay. Uh, most of them had serial numbers starting with an L, and most of them were from the 1963A or 1969 series. Um, okay. Um, just I, for the serial numbers. Sorry. I'm not exactly a serial number <laughs> you're, mint oh, nerd. You're not a serial head? <laughs> Yes, I'm a serial killer, if you will. Um, how common is a serial number starting in a certain letter? Do they go throughout the whole alphabet? Do you have any idea? Oh, that's a great question. Um, in this case, the L actually indicated that it came from which um, reserve it came from. I think it was because it came from San Francisco originally. Okay. Interesting. Um and then the the other part is just the, these are most of the serial numbers, you know, had 1963A or 1969 um, in them. So how easy would it be for them to track it down if it was put into circulation? If someone was looking? Really easy. Really easy. So it's pretty just specific. To, yeah. It, okay. each, each bill only has one serial number, right? Right. And they also took a microfilm picture just to be uh, safe. They took a microfilm picture of each of the 10,000 bills. So what... Uh, I'm shocked this only took two hours. So That's insane. What agent? What agents oh had God. to do that? But you know that they dined out on that story for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I worked on the D.B. Cooper case. It's casual. That's right. Um, <laughs> Just taking pictures of dollar bills. 
And as for the chutes, they got some uh, uh, parachutes from McCord Air Force Base, which is nearby. Um, and McCord personnel uh, uh, got them some military grade uh, parachutes. Are we sure they worked? Um, we are fairly sure that they worked, but hold on. Oh. I was going to say, because I wouldn't put it past him to rig it. Because Dan Cooper rejected those military shoots and demanded civilian-grade shoots instead. <laughs> I'm just a man. Yeah, he's like, no, give me war- <laughs> give me the cheaper parachutes. This is too bougie for me. Okay, that's weird. That's a weird choice. And so the SPD had to go get those from a local skydiving school. All right. Um, <laughs> anyway, this whole time, the plane is still circling overhead. And uh, Tina Mucklow is another uh, flight attendant. She's the one who's mostly been dealing with Cooper after that initial note passing. Uh, and she said he... Florence was like, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> Tina, you go deal with this asshole. Tina's like, I'll see his bomb. <laughs> yes. He said he had a big bomb. Uh, she said he seemed familiar with the local terrain. Uh, he, he looked down as they were flying over Tacoma and he said, bah, looks like Tacoma down there. Oh, it's dirt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sh- sure is a, a forest down there. He's so familiar. Um, and while they were circling the airport, he, uh, commented offhand, you know, um, yeah, McCord Air Force Base is only a 20 minute drive away, isn't it? Which is true and, and not necessarily something most, um, civilians would have known certainly not somebody who wasn't from the area so that's interesting Mm -hmm. um she also said and this is uh quoting mucklow now he wasn't nervous he seemed rather nice he was never cruel or nasty he was thoughtful and calm all the time wow you really embodied tina mucklow there yeah tina i i think i understand tina (laughs) um she said he also uh well in this phase when they were uh, circling he ordered a second bourbon and soda why not Paid, paid his drink tab. Okay, why, though? <laughs> and told Tina to keep the change, which she declined. <laughs> I'd really rather not. Thank you. <laughs> um, he also offered to request meals for the flight crew during the stop in Seattle. Okay, I kind of like this guy. Yeah, no, he's, like he's kind of cool. Bit. He's like, like, hey, you guys hungry? Yeah, like, I'm sorry. Like, it was awkward. Guys, I know, this, is, this is a little awkward. Can we get something in a nosh here? <laughs> So, 5.24 p.m. We're going to ignore the barks. 5.24 p.m., Cooper gets word that his demands have been met from the ground. And at 5.39 p.m., he finally allows the plane to touch down at Seattle-Tacoma Airport. Okay. He demands Scott, remember that's the pilot, taxi uh, the plane over to an isolated, brightly lit area of the runway. This was at, at night. Okay. Uh, Why? Because he was so confused by wearing sunglasses inside that he's like, I'll need the light because well, no, I'm on. not taking these puppies off. He also had him put down all of the window shades, every passenger window shade, just to uh, deter FBI snipers who Cooper th- thought might be involved. That's interesting. Yeah. So put the plane in a super brightly lit area so the guy's night vision goggles or whatever won't work. Hmm. Um, so all, all this, you know, it kind of sounds like somebody who knows what he's, uh, doing in a certain way, or maybe he was just smart. Who knows? Mm-hmm. If you were really smart, you probably wouldn't do this. <laughs> yeah. Um, the drop of the money was made by Al Lee. He was a Northwest Orient Seattle operations manager, but he did it in street clothes. He was just in like jeans and a, a polo or something. Um, because he was afraid that Cooper might mistake him for a cop and shoot him or something or oh. blow up the plane. Boy, now this guy's having the worst work day of his life. He's like (laughs) shitting himself, trying not to get shot. He's also really putting on airs where he thinks his his fucking his airline (laughs) uniform is going to be so intimidating. Just just the blazer (laughs) with the little pin on it. It's like, oh, got to shoot this guy. He sees the little the little wing pin on his chest and uh, and we all go boom. It's okay, Al. You can make it happen. So, uh. Tina Mucklow opened the rear aft stairs. That's the same stairs that um, our friend Schaffner had been sitting on before where Cooper was talking to her. Okay. So she opens that that uh, that stair back there and um, Tina Mucklow goes down and gets the money uh, from Mr. Al Lee. And then once he checked the money and the parachutes, Cooper ordered all passengers, Schaffner and Alice Hancock, who was another flight attendant. She was the senior uh, flight attendant on the crew. Uh, all of them off. But Tina and the pilot are still on, at least. Tina and the flight crew get to stay. Here's who's left on the plane. Only five people. 
Uh, you've got Dan Cooper. Mm-hmm. You've got the pilot, William Scott. You've got the co-pilot, William Radizak. Mm-hmm. Tina Mucklow. And the flight engineer, H.E. H. E. Henderson. That's the third member of a flight crew. If you're Florence, are you feeling like a little offended? That he's like, you know what? I'm going to keep this one. You go. Can I be honest with you? As I was reading through this material, I was a little offended for Florence. <laughs> like, at first, it's all it's all Florence, and he's handing her this note and everything. Mm-hmm. And then about halfway through the story, it changes to entirely Tina, 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 Tina. Uh, must have been tough. Well, she took a real liking to, to Dan Cooper. So maybe that's why he uh, maybe it was more advantageous to him to keep Tina around. More mutual affection there. Or, or at least one way. Yeah. So while the plane was refueling, remember he requested that fuel truck be there. Cooper tells the uh, the flight crew what the plan is. They're going to fly southeast toward Mexico City. He wants them to do it as slowly as you could possibly can without stalling the plane, which for a 727 is about 100 knots, and he said so. Mm-hmm. Um, he wanted them to go no higher than 10,000 feet above the ground. Okay. Just low and slow, baby. The whole way. And he wanted to keep the landing gear open. Did they refuel? Yeah. They, okay. Well, he's telling the crew this. They're refueling the plane. Okay. Because I don't know why I think this. It might be a fact. But I thought that you are you don't usually take much more gas um, because of weight and stuff than you need to for a flight. And I doubt that they would need as much for a 30-minute flight. So I didn't know if they would, especially with all the taxiing stuff, I didn't know if they would have refueled for... Where are they now? Seattle to Mexico City? Yeah. So we'll remember that uh, that was part of his demands to have a refueling truck ready. Right. Okay. So they, they're, while they're filling the truck up, he tells them he wants, uh, yeah, remember, no, no faster than 100 knots. Okay. No more than 10,000 feet. Landing gear down. Wing flaps tilted down 15 degrees. And he wanted the cabin to be depressurized. <laughs> oh, okay. So this is all just to prep for jumping out. Yeah, basically he wants to be in jump-ready condition as he gets off the runway. Because you would think he he would want it fast and high, Mm -hmm. so they didn't try to shoot him down or something crazy. No, uh, the co-pilot, William Radizak, said, uh, we can't make it to Mexico City. This plane's got a thousand-mile range. We we wouldn't be able to make it without a refueling stop. And so Cooper uh, apparently very pleasantly was like, oh, uh, okay, so where should we make our refueling stop? And he was taking suggestions, and everyone kind of chatted about it and worked out that uh, Reno would be a good spot for a refueling stop on their way to Mexico City. I'd love to go to Reno if we could do that. Thank you, Tina. (laughs) Love you, Dan. (laughs) So with that plan settled on, Cooper directed Scott to take off. And uh, he tried, but the home office said uh, they wouldn't allow the plane to take off with the rear door open and the stairs out. It just wasn't safe. It, okay. And Cooper, sure. Cooper apparently, I love this. I like this guy more. The more uh, further into the story you read, uh, Cooper grumbled that um, it was indeed safe. But that he wasn't going to argue the point and was happy to just lower it once they were in the air. Oh, I guess. Fine. It's, it's actually safe. But whatever. An FAA official also requested a face-to-face with him, uh, which was promptly denied, and the plane took off. Fair. So this is 7.40 p.m. Remember, there's only five people on this plane now, and it takes off, now trailed by two F-106 fighters that scrambled from McCord Air Base to uh, follow. <laughs> okay. Um, they diverted a few other military planes as well along the way, but I don't think they ever made visual contact. Overall, there were like five different planes following this thing as it went. So again, like, I just can't imagine why you'd want to be low and slow, even if you are jumping out of the thing. Let's find out. Okay. After, after takeoff, Cooper tells Mucklow to go into the cockpit and close the door. Wait there with the rest of the crew. Okay. As she complies, she sees him tying something around his waist. Was it his sweater because he was getting a little hot? <laughs> well, uh, probably not. Remember, the cabin door's open. Yeah, so He's it wasn't cool. the parachute. He's getting cool, if anything. Um, a lot of people speculate he had cut um, to, we'll get to this, but he had cut apart, uh, he had cannibalized some of the other parachutes he'd been given. Because he asked for four, right? Yeah, so he cut some straps out of them and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, so people theorize he was tying the ransom money to his body before he jumped. 
Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's too crazy to think. No, that, that that's where I would tend to land on that. Mm-hmm. Um, he could have also. He was wearing a trench coat, I think. Sure. So he could of have. Of course, he was. He could have also been tying his trench coat. <laughs> I mean, it, just keeping everything in. It's you know? got a sash, right? So. <laughs> um, so he's tying something around his waist. Whatever. Maybe it was a. I don't know. Fanny pack. He could have been strapping a fanny pack on. <laughs> and who wouldn't? At eight o'clock p.m. Tina's in the cabin with the rest of the crew. They're huddled around. A warning light flashes, indicating the aft stairs. Again, those same aft stairs that Florence Schaffner was sitting on. Mm -hmm. The same ones that Tina got the ransom through. The same ones they had to close before they took off. Those aft stairs uh, are activated. Okay. And the crew feels the cabin pressure change. So they can be activated from the cabin, not the cockpit. Uh, yes, I believe they can be activated from both, but on this particular model of uh, 727, the aft stair controls couldn't be overridden from the cockpit. Okay, so they could be activated, but not overridden, and vice versa. Okay, okay. So that was at 8 o'clock. Around 8.13, the weather starts to get worse. Around 8.13, they're flying through a heavy rainstorm in southern Washington. Ugh, my nightmare... What, Southern Washington? <laughs> yes. No, flying through heavy rain and storms. With Oof. the door open in the back of the plane. That's a fuck that from me. Yeah. And then Dog. At, and then at 8.13, they feel a sudden upward movement from the back of the plane, and they have to, like, oh, oh, kind of grab the controls and trim and get back to even. Um, And that was it. At 10.15 p.m., Scott and Radizak uh, landed at Reno Airport. FBI agents, state troopers, sheriff's deputies, and Reno police all surrounded the plane um, and conducted an armed search as soon as the doors were down, but uh, they quickly confirmed Cooper was gone, and so was the $200,000. What was that upward movement? Uh, They believe that was him jumping out of the plane. He shifted the whole plane? So the FBI was curious about this. In um, recreations, they actually... In a 727, produced a similar upward jerk by pushing a 200-something pound sled out of the back uh, stairs. Wow. Well, that's that's given me less confidence in air travel. <laughs> yeah, flight's a fragile thing, right? It, uh... it, and people are uh, people are heavy, so losing all that weight out of the back at once. Yeah, there's just a little, and it just takes a little bit of a jerk, right, to get the plane. It's not like it was spinning out of control, but it needed to right. be. Right. I just didn't brought, think right. that. You know, one person would shift the whole plane visibly, like, um, you know, that you could feel it. Okay. Um, yeah, and Cooper was gone. Aboard the plane, investigators found 66 latent fingerprints, a black clip-on tie, <laughs> a mother-of-pearl tie clip. That's the clip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, there's, it's a two-clipper. It's a two-clip yeah, tie. Yeah, it's a clip-on. Yeah. It's got a clip. Um, eight filter tipped Raleigh cigarette butts that he left in the ashtray Mm -hmm. and two, uh, parachutes. One had been opened and two lines had been cut from the canopy. So again, that's what they speculate. He was tying something to himself with probably the ransom money. Now the fingerprints that they found, is that total or is that just from his area? Do you know Uh, what I mean? I think 66 latent fingerprints aboard the plane. Okay, so any one of those could be him? Yeah, and not all of them are from the same person. Right. And yeah. Okay. Hmm. And they quickly made a composite sketch from the interviews they did with uh, all the people who had talked to him, because quite a few people had. I don't know how long it takes for DNA to decay too far that they can't be tested, but did they keep those cigarettes? Um, I believe the FBI, we'll get into the whole investigation, trust me, Mm -hmm. and there's a lot to cover. (laughs) Um, I believe the FBI uh, has his DNA on file. Mm -hmm. That's just never matched anything. That's what I think based on things they've said. Uh, Although... We can get into it. Yes, we'll get into it. The, The DNA match the FBI thinks they have, I think, is actually from the tie clip. Oh, weird. Yeah. <laughs> Just rolling that tie clip all over my face when I put it on. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So let's take a break, and uh, maybe when we get back, uh, I can tell you, we can run through some theories. I wish you would. Welcome back. 
when we when last we left DB Cooper, he was shooting off into where now remember this was a uh, pitch black Washington night with in pouring rain. Why didn't he wait a little longer to jump out? This was the plan. To jump into the rain? To jump where he jumped, I guess. I guess. Doesn't seem like a good plan. Now here's something I have to I have to nail down. This episode is called D.B. Cooper. Mm-hmm. But I've been talking about Dan Cooper. Mm-hmm. Oh, shit, I've been doing... Carrie, I've been doing the wrong hijacking. <laughs> well, where did the B come from? No, there was an Oregon man named D.B. Cooper who had a minor police record. Okay. And um, police briefly considered him as a suspect. The FBI briefly considered him as a suspect, thinking on the off chance this guy actually used his real name. Uh, and then he, they quickly ruled him out. But an Oregon reporter was rushing to a deadline, and he confused the suspect name D.B. Cooper with the alias from the case, Dan Cooper. Mm-hmm. And then either the AP or UPI, that's another like news wire service, picked up his error, republished it, and that's why everyone thinks of this person as D.B. Cooper. Oh. It's almost a Mandela effect. Yeah, that is weird. I mean, D.B. Cooper does sound, like, more mysterious than Way Dan. Way cooler. Like, Dan Cooper's, like, my dad's buddy that, like, grills hot dogs and right. asks if I want a hamburger, too. Dan Cooper wouldn't be mentioned in nearly as many rap lyrics. <laughs> is that a thing? Oh, yeah. D.B. Cooper and rap? Sure, absolutely. Average MCs is like a TV blooper. MF Doom, he's like D.B. Cooper. Because he jumped out of a plane? Yeah, I guess. Okay. MF Doom's always jumping out of planes. Sorry, I'm not... I'm not hip to the rap scene clearly <laughs> nobody's hip to mf doom it's okay so the search area here was hard to define because obviously you're going to go right into a manhunt right you think a man jumped out of a plane with two hundred thousand dollars wearing a trench coat mm -hmm. in a rainstorm and you they kind of know where he jumped out. like did they they noted the time when they felt that shift yes the flight crew noted the time of that and uh Again, the FBI was, that's why they were doing that. The tests pushing the sled out the back of the plane right. was to see like, okay, so can we assume 813 is the jump time? And they decided they could. Okay. Now, it's still hard to define that search area though, because a small difference in the speed of the plane, mm -hmm. a small difference in the altitude. Well, how exacting was Dan Cooper when he was like, you have to go a hundred knots and you have to go 10,000 feet. Like, did they fudge it a little bit or else you kind of know well that's, that's more specific than they might be that's true but even a difference of like a few dozen feet mm. could make a big difference in his parachute drop and maybe right. the biggest thing is how long he waited to pull the ripcord yeah and that they have no way of knowing in fact no one knows if dan cooper ever pulled the ripcord right because the two uh, jets, the, remember the two, um, they weren't F-16s, the two F-106 fighters flying mm -hmm. behind him? Uh, neither of those pilots ever saw anything visually or on their radar, but nothing that looked like a parachute opening. Um, so they were watching this plane. Yes. And two different jets, mm -hmm. and no one saw a, a dude jump out of it? No, but he was wearing black clothes, and it was at the middle of the night in the middle of a rainstorm. How does a parachute perform in a rainstorm? Uh, I feel it's, like it would be much more difficult. The The rain is a problem and the uh, the wind is actually probably a bigger problem. Right. Uh, jumping in a storm like this, we'll get to this, would be a big, big risk. Yeah. Um, so yeah, neither fl pilot saw a shoot visually or on radar. Um, the manhunt lasted for days. Uh, there was aerial surveillance that whole time as well, and uh, teams, hundreds of FBI agents uh, and some National Guardsmen came back after the spring thaw in 72 and dragged lakes um, and did, uh, you know, continuing manhunts for, for months after this thing. Um, they actually found a skeleton, mm -hmm. uh, but then it turned out that was just a teenage girl who'd been abducted and murdered the summer before. Jeez. Yeah. What year is this? Uh, it was 1972, so, I mean, mm. prime serial killer time. I think it's pre-Bundy, though, because that was his turf. Ah. Big Washington forest guy. This was ultimately one of the most expensive, uh, extensive, and intensive uh, domestic manhunts in U.S. history, and it never turned up 
not only the guy, it never turned up a material trace or clue. Wow. No parachute straps, no parachute pieces, no bits of his suit. Money. No money. Never in circulation or anything like that. We'll get to the money. Okay. The serial numbers uh, for all of those, remember they had taken a picture of every single bill? <laughs> Poor fucker, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> those those serial number lists were distributed to banks, casinos, racetracks, just anybody who deals with a, a bunch of money moving through. Mm-hmm. Um, so that they could watch basically all the money that came through. The Attorney General, uh, in early 1972, when they weren't getting any traction that way, uh, released those same lists to the general public. So all of these serial numbers were publicly searchable. In 19... Well, it, but if that's the only way, I mean, do you really think our racetrack's going to be very diligent about it? Like, maybe a bank, but casinos racetracks the bodega down the way like they're not going to be checking every bill that's a great point what's in it for them yeah in 1973 one oregon newspaper offered a one thousand dollar reward to anyone who could produce a db cooper bill wow around the same time another um washington newspaper offered five thousand dollars for the same thing take that oregon no takers oh not a single bill ever showed up. Hmm. Well, to be fair, you're wagering a thousand or five thousand dollars, and you're gonna get very closely looked at if you present that money for that reward. That's true. So you're taking a risk. That's true, but um, Northwest Orient also offered a. I want to say it was a 25% reward on any re- any returned money with no questions asked. Hmm. Okay. So like, hey, if you find it, if you are DB Cooper, we don't care. Whatever. Uh, just just give us the money. We'll give you a quarter of it back. <laughs> and no one took them up on that either. Tina's like, I know that trench coat. That's DB. By the way, their insurance company eventually paid out on that ransom money. In interesting it feels like something that'll come up in a uh, theory later but it actually doesn't Aww. i know nobody's nobody's claimed that it was an inside job although i don't know why they haven't well yeah i mean he knows so much about planes and all this stuff he could have worked for them sean i think we solved it no oh, we haven't solved it yet baby shit but we will meanwhile 1972 brought copycats mm-hmm <laughs> Can you imagine hearing about this case and going, yeah, why not me? I can imagine it if I was very stupid and very overconfident uh, because he did get away with it till that point. And, you know, now we know till now. Have you ever heard of another hijacking exactly like that? No. What if I told you that 15 of them happened in 1972? <laughs> Uh, pardon? Yeah, after... Did they get away with it? None of them. Oh, well, yeah, okay. Not a single one was successful. Uh, It's more fun when it's spooky and mysterious and he he disappeared into the woods without a trace or whatever. Right. Some of these guys don't even get as far as um, negotiating with the airline. Some of them get caught with weapons. Some of them um, get a little further. Some of them make their money and then uh, get arrested later. The most famous uh, and notable one of these, and some have actually suggested this guy could be Dan Cooper because of the similarities uh, in their styles. Mm-hmm. Richard Floyd McCoy Jr. Um, did the most famous of these hijackings, these copycat hijackings, on April 7th, 1972. He was an Army vet. He'd done two tours in Vietnam. Um, and later on, he was a warrant officer in the Utah National Guard and an avid recreational skydiver. Okay, so he hears this story. He's like, fuck, I could do that. Yeah, sure. So he hijacked United Airlines 855. That was a 727 with an aft um, staircase staircase thing thing. Uh, in Denver with a paperweight that slightly resembled a hand grenade and an unloaded handgun. (laughs) Sure. And he demanded four parachutes and $500,000. Yeah, take that, Dan. That's right. Anything you can do, I can do better. Mm-hmm. After the money was delivered at San Francisco International, he bailed out over Provo, Utah. Okay. Made his jump successfully. 
but unlike Mr. Cooper, he left behind both his handwriting and his fingerprints on a magazine, and he was arrested on April 9th. So it took two days to find him, and then he, he was sentenced to 45 years in prison. Yikes. Yeah. But good news for Richard Floyd McCoy. Two years later, he and several accomplices escaped from Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary by crashing a garbage truck out the main gate. This sounds Were fake. they caught? Oh, yeah. Uh, three months later, the feds tracked him down in Virginia Beach and uh, shot them all to death. Sorry? Yeah, he was killed in a gunfight with the, uh, with the feds. Yikes. Yeah, don't do don't do hijackings. <laughs> and that's an official ain't it scary stance. No hijackings. Yeah, I would stand by that. <laughs> you would? <laughs> oh good. That's good. I'm glad we can agree on these things before we get married. That's right. The fundamentals of a relationship. The FBI continued to investigate the case, and we'll get to some of the suspects they looked at over the years, but uh leads started to slow down pretty quickly. Then in November 1978, this is just interesting, uh, the FBI hasn't even said it's definitely evidence, but um, a deer hunter in 78 did find a placard with instructions for lowering the aft door of a 727 uh, near Castle Rock, Washington. A placard? Yeah, like like it would be hanging next to the, um, it would be hanging next to the stairs. <laughs> so it's like, I'll take this with me. Well, it's interesting. It's well... I need something to read on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> like well, when you're in the bathroom and you don't have your phone, you're just reading the back of the Febreze air freshener. Well, Castle Rock is, is well north of Lake Merwin, which is where the FBI's search area was. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is in the plane's flight path. So it's possible that like when the doors opened, this placard went flying out, right? And that's like a, a little artifact of the Cooper uh, flight right there. Okay. But uh, anyway, I just thought it was interesting. That was a deer hunter found that. He was like, what's this? <laughs> Why? He's in Washington. He's not going to sound like that. Legitimately, the most interesting find um, since 1971 in the Cooper case uh, came on Sunday, February 10th, 1980. I remember the day well. <laughs> uh, so Brian Ingram, he's an eight-year-old boy. I think I've heard of this, actually. He's on vacation with his family. Mm-hmm. Do you know where this is going? somewhat like uh, this is familiar to me he's on vacation with his family near vancouver washington uh, on the columbia river um and he's um splashing around uh he's playing like kids do he's actually raking the riverbank to so he can build a campfire fun. Oh, he sounds fun pretty industrious for an eight-year-old yeah um he's like a kid from it or something and he found three packets of bills heavily disintegrated but still in rubber bands Okay. In, um, in the, like, while raking up the... From the river, yeah. Okay. That's cool. And it turned out it was uh, three bundles of of the Cooper uh, So they bills. did find some. Yeah. That, okay. But those are the only ones ever, um, ever found, which leaves uh, 9,710 bills still in circulation somewhere that have never been Or have um, never found. been circulated. Or have I mean, it would be insane to do this hijacking and just never spend the money but yeah did they like i mean i assume they they tore up that area looking for more clues of course um did he get to keep the money well i looked into that after protracted and bitter negotiations (laughs) um the insurance company that um technically owned the money uh agreed grudgingly to split it evenly with the child (laughs) they kept half of the bills these guys and he got the other half of the bills, less 14 that the FBI kept as evidence. Keep it from the insurance side of the bills. Man, poor kid. What do you think those bills are worth? Oh, well, because they're the D.B. Cooper bills, a lot of money. Much more than even inflation would account for. There were about 290 bills there. You got to keep about half of those, right? Okay. Um, in 2008, he sold 15 of those at auction um, for a cool $37,000. Good for him. Proud of him. Good for you, Brian Ingram. And he still has a ton more. I mean, maybe he's given a couple away over the years to like, I don't know, people he's dated or something. <laughs> like, hey, <laughs> get a little of this. But yeah, I mean, that'll set your kids up for life just like sell a bill here a bill there college fund here 
first car there. Absolutely. Good for him. Loving it. <laughs> rake your rake the banks, kids. Make those fires. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, sounds like we're encouraging some bad behavior. Those serial numbers are still publicly searchable. You can pull it up online and just um, type in any serial number of a bill you have and find out whether it's one of D.B. Cooper's spills. That's a fun Sunday afternoon project. Yeah. Looking up the serial numbers? No, I'm looking up the... um, I was checking the statute of limitations on... Hijacking? Hijacking. More fun Google searches that will get us arrested someday. Yeah, so there is a statute a statute of limitations on hijacking. Um, it's five years. That's it? Yeah. Then or still? Um, certainly then, I, I believe also still. Uh, however, that's irrelevant. As uh, in, in November 1976, as they were reaching the end of that mm-hmm. uh, uh, limit, a Portland grand jury indicted John Doe, a.k.a. Dan Cooper, in, a, in absentia uh, for air piracy and vi- violation of the Hobbs Act. So that officially started a legal proceeding that can be uh, continued at any time. That doesn't seem legal. I'm just telling starting, you what Starting a trial or a proceeding or whatever for someone that you don't know who they are? Against John Doe, a.k.a. Dan Cooper. I am bamboozled, Sean. I know. I don't think that's legal. Listen, here's what I'm telling you. My reading suggests, and we, we, have, lawyer, we have a lawyer friend who we should ask about this. My reading suggests... That once that proceeding has been opened, now you don't have to worry about the statute of limitations anymore because there's an ongoing legal proceeding. Oh, I know proceeding. why they did it, but I didn't know that you could indict someone that you don't even know who they are. Why don't they do that in every crime where there's a statute of limitations? The photos Dulos' lawyer is trying to get them to try him and he's dead. Yeah, but at least they know what his name is, who he is. They can bring the corpse to court and say, oh, I'm here, you know, like they don't know who this guy is. That would be I, I think he was a bad guy, but that would be in poor taste. <laughs> <laughs> Says you. But it's 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 a crazy thing to do. I've never heard of that anywhere else in any other case. I mean, I'm sure it exists because this seems like a great loophole. So great that it shouldn't exist. Mm-hmm. But wow. Anyway, there is a current legal proceeding against John Doe, a.k.a. Dan Cooper. Does it take tax money to keep that kind of thing going? I would assume so, yeah. Great. (laughs) Great. So in order to narrow down our suspects here, Carrie, I thought uh, we would need a suspect profile. So everyone named Dan Cooper, who was middle-aged at the time. That's right. So I have the list right here. (laughs) No, here's here's what the FBI was thinking. And I I see where their head's at here. The FBI felt... Uh, by the way, they have a page on the D.B. Cooper case. You can go there, you can click, and you can look through all of their evidence um, because the case is, uh, it was officially closed after 45 years in 2016. But um, So can there, well, I guess there can still be legal proceedings done. Yeah. You could reopen it. And, okay. and local bureau offices will still accept material D.B. Cooper evidence if you have it. Um, yeah, sure they will. <laughs> but, no, keep your D.B. Cooper money. But so it's you, no good here. So you can go look at all, all the, the, the case uh, information, which is very interesting. Um, anyway, this suspect uh, appeared to be familiar with the area, right? Sure. And they thought he may have been an Air Force veteran because of his knowledge of the airplanes. And um, also, remember, he, he said, like, oh, it's only 20 minutes from the airbase down there. Mm-hmm. So they were like, okay, that's Or that's he could have worked for the airline. They thought he was likely financially desperate. Because uh, an air hijacking is an extraordinarily risky crime, and uh, and especially the way he did it. So why would you do that unless you absolutely needed money? Um, or was he just a thrill seeker? Well, if he was financially desperate, then he, they're not looking for a live person. Because that money would have turned up somewhere. He would have had to spend it on something. That's a good point. So... He was also knowledgeable about aircraft. He asked for uh, four parachutes. Why did he do that? He wanted to strap one each to each limb and just 
<laughs> fly out of there, spread eagle. I wonder if that would quadruple your chances of survival on a, uh, a risky jump. Yeah, but then how do you land? No, he asked for four shoots to force the assumption that he would force one of the other hostages to jump with him. Okay. And then you're not going to give him a faulty shoot. I see. Why four? Two primary and two backup. I see. You always jump with a reserve parachute. Oh, okay. Well, now I know. Mm -hmm. Um, However. It's pretty smart. It is. It is pretty smart, right? Uh, He also chose a 727, likely because it has high aft engines that allow more than any other similar sized aircraft a safe jump out of the rear stairs instead of getting sucked sucked in. right into the engine yeah it would be really smoky back there on a 727 but you you wouldn't uh, get sucked in like uh, the incredibles or anything into the jet turbine ah <laughs> uh, yes the scientific film the incredibles it, the his planning of the crime also shows uh, a knowledge of refueling times mm-hmm. and he knew what wing flap angle to tell the crew to set the wings at that's very specific yeah, so they originally thought he was an experienced jumper. Or pilot. Yeah, or pilot. Sure. Um, Not necessarily Air Force, though. But the FBI said eventually, over the course of a few years, they decided that um, they were looking for an inexperienced jumper or someone who had never jumped in their life, actually. Okay, so the complete opposite. <laughs> and they said the reason for that was, and this is a direct quote from an FBI agent, No experienced parachutist would have jumped in the pitch black night in the rain with a 172 mile per hour wind in his face wearing loafers and a trench coat. Depends on how desperate you are. Well, the loafers and the trench coat, that's up in the air, literally. But if he's desperate enough to hijack a plane, he might be desperate enough to make that jump. Also, the parachute he took had a dummy reserve parachute. Uh, It was a training model. Remember how he wanted the ones from the local uh, skydiving Mm -hmm. school? So So he didn't have a reserve. No, and the the FBI stresses that that was an accident on their part. Sure. Quote, unquote. (laughs) They stress that was an accident, but um, he didn't check. Or didn't seem to check, because he took the one that had the dummy. The other one had a a legit functioning backup. And you can easily tell that if you know what you're looking at? Clearly marked. Okay. And they said any, any, you know regular trained jumper would check that it's just part of your reflexes so maybe he knows a lot about planes but not necessarily a lot about jumping so that's what we've got pilot i've gotten to the end of my evidence caroline okay well who are the people let's talk about kenneth christensen please do in 2003, I think these are these are going, uh, they're not quite from least likely to most likely, but um, I think some of these are just shots in the dark early on here. We'll hear several of these. There's a, a trend of people reading a lot about D.B. Cooper or seeing a documentary and then going, you know what? It was this dead relative of mine. It was Uncle Dan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in 2003, uh, Lyle Christensen of Minnesota watched a TV documentary about D.B. Cooper. And he became convinced that D.B. Cooper had, or sorry, that Dan Cooper had been uh, his late brother, Kenneth. Okay. Now let's talk about Kenneth. I'm still waiting. Kenneth enlisted in the Army in 1944. He was trained as a paratrooper. He would have been middle-aged um, around the time of the... Um, hijacking. Hijacking. He became a mechanic uh, and then a flight attendant for Northwest Orient. So he was a plane mechanic. Yes. Okay. He was 45 at the time of the hijacking. He was about 5'8 and about 150 pounds, which makes him both smaller and thinner than D.B. Cooper was described as being. Mm -hmm. But did he have a history of wearing his sunglasses indoors? Uh, That's not commented on, but he did (laughs) smoke and he did like bourbon. Yeah, so did everyone in 1971. What are you talking about? Ah, but what about this? Shortly after the hijacking, a few months later... Kenneth Christensen reportedly purchased a house in cash. In cash organ or? In <laughs> in cash money. And, and then, they didn't, uh, those serial numbers weren't checked at all? And then while dying of cancer in 1994, he told his brother Lyle, There is something you should know, but I cannot tell you. Ugh, now's the time, Ken. 
Uh, after his death, family members discovered gold coins, a valuable stamp collection that he had hidden away in lockboxes, and over $200,000 in bank accounts. Did any of this money ever get checked? He, Except for the coins, because obviously D.B. Cooper didn't have coins. Well, the money was all in bank accounts. It's all zeros and ones. Um, he also had a bunch of Northwest Orient news clippings from throughout the years, speci- uh, with suspiciously nothing about the Cooper hijacking, which was the most newsworthy thing that ever happened to Northwest Orient. And was he working for them when the hijacking happened? Very much so. Hmm. That's weird. However, internet sleuths have been on this for a little while, and of uh, they did some digging and found out that, yeah, actually he had a 17-year mortgage on that house. So, so not in cash. And all the money in the bank accounts, um, he had sold about two dozen acres of land like just before he died, and that went for about 17000 an acre, so... Okay. Kind of more or less works out. I wonder what he had to tell Lyle that he had to tell him but couldn't tell him. He probably fucked his wife. Oh, Lyle, if you're listening, I'm sorry, man. Yeah, get a job, <laughs> cuck. No. Oh, <laughs> poor Lyle. His name's already Lyle. No, we love you, Lyle. Call us. Call me. All right, so uh, what do you think? Hey, on a scale of one... Um, to 10 on the plausibility meter. Where are we on Lyle? Kenneth. Uh, no, I want to know about Lyle, too. I think he might be involved. <laughs> Lyle's like a one, okay? Um, Kenneth, hmm. I'll give it a six. Okay. Because I like him because he's very into that particular airline. Mm-hmm. I'm still liking the idea it was an inside job somehow. Mm-hmm. Um. And he knows a lot about the things that he needs to know a lot about for this whole thing. So I kind of like him. Kind of yeah. like Ken. Absolutely. But what if it was Jack Caulfield? What if? By the way, we're going to be here a while because the FBI seriously considered over a thousand suspects in the in the <laughs> uh, Norjack. <laughs> was he of the age? Does he have a white sounding name? Let's do it. Done. <laughs> um, Jack Caulfield was a con man who claimed to have been once been the chauffeur of Abraham Lincoln's last descendant, Robert Todd Lincoln Beckwith. Did uh, you follow all that? Okay, sure. This is a guy who once claimed, like his job was kind of walking around claiming he used to drive around Abe Lincoln's like great nephew. Okay, that's not too crazy. It's kind though. of a con man. Well, what what is he getting out of that? Around night, well, um... He would try to sell his story to people as books or as, uh, you know, he would do talks where he would talk about the, the Lincolns. And... But he only knew the one Lincoln. Yeah, and he probably didn't even know him. <laughs> right. Okay, sure. So he Seems al- harmless. He also started claiming he was D.B. Cooper in 1972. Who wouldn't? And he tried to sell his story to a Hollywood production company. Mm-hmm. Now, this is interesting. Jack Caulfield claimed that he had, after jumping out of the plane, landed near Mount Hood which is a, a ways away from the uh, search area mm-hmm. that the FBI was using. That's Oregon, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He said he hurt his leg and uh, lost all the money in the process. Wouldn't you know it? <sighs> yeah. I mean. <laughs> now, evidence in Jack Caulfield's favor. He was really in Portland that day and he hurt his leg somehow. Okay. That's it. <laughs> that's the evidence? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, and the FBI said his story was actually really differed in a lot of ways from info they hadn't made public and um there was just no chance they always hold something back so they can see okay right but i thought he was a fun character jack he's fun he's harmless uh are we giving him a one Mm, give him a 1.5 because he's fun she's generous i am lynn doyle cooper Ooh, we're getting to a cooper we have a cooper L.D. Cooper. L.D.C. died in 1999 okay. and was then proposed as a suspect uh, in the case by his niece in 2011. Okay. This is, once again, you know who that reminds me of is... Uncle Lynn. Right. So when she was eight, she said she remembered Uncle Lynn and another one of her uncles planning something, quote, very mischievous <laughs> involving the use of, quote, expensive walkie-talkies. 
We have an eight-year-old's memory to go on here, so. Well, it's also, they're two, like, middle-aged dudes. They're probably planning to, like, crash their wives' Tupper par- Tupperware party or something. Uh, they were at their, this is at her grandmother's house, about 150 miles southeast of Portland. And uh, when the uncles came home from turkey hunting, um, mm-hmm. by the way, they then left for a turkey hunting trip in between the hijacking happened. Mm-hmm. And then they came home and uh, old L.D. Cooper came home in a bloody shirt. And when he was asked about it, he said it came from a car accident. And then he didn't say anything else about it. Well, maybe they hit a deer. Uh, they he, were hunting. Of course he has blood. He was also obsessed with uh, Dan Cooper, the comic book hero. Oh, by the way, there was a Belgian comic called Dan Cooper. <laughs> Belgian? Yeah. And he was like a, a cool World War One or World War Two guy who did, you know, he, he would jump out of planes and stuff like that. Like kind of a daredevil adventurer. Interesting. Dan Cooper. But wasn't published in the United States, which... L- for a while, the FBI was kicking around the idea that maybe this guy was Canadian. Because Canadians get Dan Cooper comics, but um, don't have an accent. Also, it's pretty close to that part of the United States, Canada. Oh, yeah, for sure. So I wouldn't rule it out. No, certainly not. Um, it's also possible that if he was American, he could have seen these Dan Cooper comics when he was um, overseas uh, on tour. Because they think he probably was a military vet. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so LD was obsessed with uh, Dan Cooper, the the comic book. So he had uh, he had a picture of him tacked on his wall. That's very cute. This adult man <laughs> says you you have a Doctor Who picture right behind me. Yeah, but that's different, Carrie. It came from the the uh, like Michaels or something. It's classy. It's painted on wood. <laughs> it's painted. <laughs> <laughs> it's printed on wood. So that's Lynn Doyle Cooper. That's it? Yeah, the FBI doesn't really, uh, uh, doesn't really, isn't really into it. Yeah, no. You, you don't buy that one? No. He, Negative one. They were planning something very mischievous. Yeah, killing a bunch of deer. With expensive walkie-talkies. Killing a bunch of deer. And then he came home with a, wait, Carrie, what, are, what about the bloody shirt? He killed a bunch of deer. They Possibly were turkeys, with his car. But I take your point. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Next candidate, John List. This one's very interesting. It's not, I wouldn't call it fun. Uh, John List. Oh, geez. John List was an accountant uh, and a World War II and Korean War vet. Uh, and old John murdered his wife, his three teenage children, and his 85-year-old mother in Westfield, New Jersey. Westfield. Home of the Watcher. And some of your family. Yeah, and some of my cousins. Uh, so what? It, it's a pretty small town, too. It is. I've been the there. It's Westfield like, what? town we've Westfield town story we've covered in, in a short span here. Oh, that's horrible. So he killed his wife, his three teenage children, and his 85-year-old mother. Jesus. And withdrew $200,000 from his wife's uh, banking account. Mm-hmm. And then vanished. Sorry, his mother. I think it was his mother's banking account. And when then was he, this? 15 days before the Cooper hijacking before Mm -hmm. okay so he did the murders he withdrew the same amount of money that db cooper requested Mm -hmm. and pieced and he's never been found well he sort of matched the description which is interesting Mm -hmm. physically um he was captured in 1989 though oh and john list well good but and john list admitted to killing his family but denied any involvement in the cooper hijacking so well so the same amount of money is interesting, but why would, if, if he already had $200,000, why would he need another $200,000? Well, I don't know. Why did he kill his family? Well, I don't know, Sean. Why did he say he killed his family? Oh, uh, I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, um, it's interesting that it's the same amount of money, but if he already had that money... Why would he need that same amount, like, right after? He'd think of maybe in a year or something when he's running low. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I don't like him, personally. <laughs> don't like him one bit. Okay, now let's get into some guys. Th- these are the um, these are the suspects who have some support on the internet. Okay. Uh, behind, behind their identity as D.B. Cooper, not behind them, personally. <laughs> Yay, D.B. So William Gossett was a Marine Corps, Army, and Army Air Force vet who saw action in Korea and Vietnam. Okay. 
he had advanced jump training and wilderness survival in his military career. Mm -hmm. And after he uh, retired, he taught military law and hosted, this is fun, a paranormal talk show uh, on the radio. in Called Coast to Coast AM? In Salt Lake City. No, uh, mm -hmm. no, unfortunately. It, yes. It, and that man was... <laughs> George Nori. <laughs> uh, he died in 2003. Okay. So why, why do people think him, aside from the military career? Well, William Gossett was widely known to be obsessed with D.B. Cooper. He collected binders full of articles about the guy. He had a paranormal talk show i mean you're obsessed with db cooper now quote, i don't think it's you oh, but i haven't told you yet carrie that quote one of his wives end quote said uh because he's been married a few times so, oh but said, not at the same time no said i, I didn't know it was Salt Lake City. i know we saw tiger king recently <laughs> uh one of his wives said he could uh, he told her he could quote write the epitaph for db cooper Okay. I'm not sure that proves anything, except he's not sure what an epitaph is. Right. Um, and also, I could probably do that about any number of people. Right. Now, it seems like everything supporting Gossip being D.B. Cooper comes from one guy. <laughs> There's a lawyer named Galen Cook, and I don't know if he just hates William Gossip. <laughs> I don't know if he just... There's a few. You don't know if he knows him? Um, he certainly... I think William Gossip became aware of him. Oh, yikes. Okay. Um, because he's he's just um, been on this crusade uh, to prove that William Gossett was uh, was uh, D.B. Cooper. He, he also wrote a book. So, you know, people do lots of things to sell books. But anyway, Galen Cook has three witnesses who are interesting. Okay. A retired Utah judge. Mm -hmm. Allegedly, according to Galen Cook. Not if you on can the believe, record. Correct. Okay. And we don't have a name on this person. Okay. A, quote, retired Utah judge said to Galen Cook that in 1977, William Gossett came to his office and said. <laughs> now, picture William Gossett. He's he's coming in. Uh, we, th these are all pretty mild-mannered, look, average-looking guys. Because right. Because that's... The that's Dan Cooper. So picture this mild-mannered guy coming into uh, th this judge's office. He's a pal of his. His hat, hat in hand. And he said, uh, oh, I might be in trouble. Uh, no, I, I did a, a hijacking a couple of years back, and I think I may have left some prints behind. And, um, well, I'm D.B. Cooper. <laughs> I didn't know Woody Allen was in our basement. And the judge apparently said, shut up. Don't do anything. Leave. Get out of here. You didn't tell me anything. Not a very good judge uh, of Gale character. <laughs> well, touche. Uh, Cook also says he talked to a retired lawyer from Utah who had gone with Gossett to collect $20,000 in ransom money from a lockbox in Vancouver. A ransom for what? From the plane. The 200000 we're talking about, it's all ransom money, right? It was ransom paid for the plane. Oh, I see. So he had spread it around, and in one place it was in Vancouver. In theory. Uh, the, sure. The, Did this guy talk on the record? The third witness uh, is on the record. This would just be Gossett's son, who apparently must not have liked him very much. He's on board with William Cook. Gossett Jr.? Um, no. <laughs> You're dope. <laughs> Lou Gossett uh, Sr. Yeah, sorry. That's a, that's a joke for five people that are listening. <laughs> Gossett's son said to Cook that his dad was a compulsive gambler. Who was always strapped for cash, um, but he was flashing around a big wad right before Christmas, nineteen seventy-one. Oh boy! So the son thinks called Child Protective Services. <laughs> <laughs> so the son thought that was the the, the ransom money, um, but he figures he just blew it all on on slots or whatever in Reno. Yeah, Reno, huh? Where they brought the plane? Coincidence? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. So how do you feel about this guy? William Gossett, I, I don't think there's a, there's much there. My problem with this and with several of the other theories that we're going to get to in a second here is that you have to believe this one guy or it all falls apart. Yeah. It's all Galen Cook. Mm -hmm. Just on the record, I'm going to give William Gossett a four. A four? Out of ten. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is the other one that's kind of like that. Robert Rackstraw. And this has a lot more... Um, 
energy behind it, I think, than gossip. But, okay. but uh, kind of a similar thing. Uh, Robert Rackstraw was born 1943. He was a retired pilot uh, and an ex-convict who served on a helicopter crew in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Um, he came to the Cooper Task Force's attention uh, when, after he was deported from Iran to face uh, explosives possession and check-kiting charges. What's check-kiting? I think that's when you um, just pass fraud. bad checks. Yeah, it's check fraud. It's definitely but he check was, fraud. he was pretty young in 1971. Something. Because he was born in 1970, uh, 1943? Yeah. Yes. And we, we'll get to Wouldn't that. Wouldn't look anywhere near middle-aged unless he just had a really rough upbringing. The FBI is not on board with this theory, yeah. uh, and that is the reason why. So several months later, but I love this. So the Cooper Task Force notices him when he's deported from Iran. Uh, and because of his skill set and his sort of criminalness, <laughs> his criminality, <laughs> um, they start following this guy. They start looking at him. And several months later, while they're watching him, he's on bail from that earlier check kiting thing and the explosives and the explosives <laughs> and he attempts to fake his own death by radioing a false mayday and saying i'm bailing out he's in a rented plane over monterey bay and he goes like i'm bailing out i got a crash yeah he was found like a, a few weeks later oh so he just didn't crash the plane the plane was found with him repainted Oh, that's nice. And he had forged new certificates for it. So it was like, oh, it's a totally new plane. And he just got also hit with forgery charges. <laughs> okay. Uh, so he's an interesting guy. He definitely... If Why you, is there energy behind this guy? If you look at young pictures of him, he does look like the sketch of D.B. Cooper. No question. And he was kicked out of the army earlier in 1971. Um, kind of a dishonorable thing. It was because he was... Um, I had basically lied about everything on his transcript, I guess. Like where Shocking. he went to school and for how long and, and everything else. So Thomas Colbert, not Stephen Colbert. <laughs> Thomas Colbert is a TV producer, and I'm going to maybe throw half quotes around that, uh, and and author. Uh, he's made it his life's work to nail uh, Rackstraw to the wall. He is a 40-person staff solely dedicated to uh, investigating uh, North... What is... Wait... Currently? Yeah. And what TV show does he produce? He produced a documentary with the with the Discovery Channel about, about DB Cooper. How Robert Rackstraw was DB Cooper. Oy. Yeah. But he has he's just employing forty people consistently about this? Yeah, he, he this isn't the only thing. I mean he has money. He's like a rich guy. But oh. he, th- this is what he's made his uh, his his life's work now. Okay. He published a book, obviously. And his, his, you know, this huge staff he apparently has is out uh, doing interviews and, and, and all kinds of other things. Uh, he says that he's done interviews that show there were three getaway accomplices on the ground with a small plane to extract Rackstraw after he hit the ground. And he says he's talked to people who talked to people who saw those people. Like saw them do it or just saw them like at waiting the grocery for store? Him, waiting for him to land. Okay. Um... The FBI says he was too young at the time, and there's no way he's a suspect. Um, it's not even that. It's just this whole thing is very stupid. Yeah. Well, if you go to dbcooper.com, guess who's sitting on that uh, address? Obviously. It's our old friend Tom Colbert. So if you want to read all of his stuff, it's real easy to remember. Go to dbcooper.com. Uh, and if you look at it, it does feel like you're getting a slightly slanted. He's very accusatory with the FBI. Oh. It's all about how the FBI held back documents uh, that that would prove Rackstraw to be the guy just Why? because because they were embarrassed that Thomas Colbert was right and they were wrong. Ugh. I would <coughs> hate this guy if I met him. Well, I don't know. Thomas, if you hear this, call us. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, and so he's got all these uh, sort of internet sleuths uh, on this website who, uh, in June 2018, they claimed they had uh, found a coded confession in one of the uh, Rackstraw letters that the uh, FBI had released. What letters? The FBI released a bunch of Cooper files, and then Colbert demanded more through FOIA requests. Oh, so he assumed they were Rackstraw letters. No, no, no. There was a letter from Rackstraw that his just sleuths went over until they found something that looked vaguely like a coded confession. But they had some, the FBI had something by Rackstraw in their oh, files. Yeah, they did look at him. Okay. And what did the coded confession say? I have a bomb. Uh, that's a very good question. And if you want to find out, we just need to buy Thomas Colbert's book. Of God damn it. Ugh. I hate this guy. 
Yeah, he's not great. <laughs> so, but but the, uh, do you want to hear? This is a this is a little. This is in Thomas Colbert's own words, um, but this is a brief summary of what he heard uh, from. What did they call this? Yeah, from Wally, a pilot mm-hmm. named Wally. Wally. Or sorry, Wally. No, a, a a guy named Wally claimed to have spoken to a pilot who had been involved named in Wally? the... Named Wally? No. Oh. The storyteller's name was Wally. <laughs> the pilot, he couldn't give Colbert the pilot's name, I don't sure, think. Sure, of course not. All their practiced air-to-ground coordination paid off. The jumper missed the selected drop zone by only 1,300 feet. The flyer's two-seater aircraft then swooped toward a nearby Goheen airstrip to await the, ri- the arrival of the vehicle and Cooper. When the three men pulled up to the idling Cessna, the hijacker crawled inside with his briefcase bomb and $50,000 of the jet ransom. The remaining $150,000 and parachute were driven away by the two others to be buried. Okay. Uh, he then goes on to say that... Uh, <laughs> I could say that, too, about anyone. He goes on to say that the briefcase bomb and the fifty grand uh, that Cooper had were unceremoniously dumped uh, to, to make the FBI think that he had drowned. Okay. Yeah, so uh, originally they thought that was the, the some of the money Brian Ingram had found. And then somebody pointed out that the water currents from where they said the money was dumped wouldn't really work that way to get to where Brian Ingram was. And they were like, oh, no, you know what? After further research, we believe that the money Brian Ingram found was from Cooper's later attempt. Sorry. Eh, Rackstraws. No. From Rackstraws' uh, later attempt to double back and try to re-fake drown himself again. I'm done. I'm done with this guy. Anyway, Rackstraw died uh, July 9th, 2019. He was very provocative. Uh, this this Tom Colbert stuff got him a lot of media attention, obviously. Mm-hmm. And he had a habit of saying things like, well, I don't think anyone has the answers to that case, except maybe one person. Is that me? <laughs> I don't think it is. But if it were, would I tell you? It's all things is that like, like a real. No, it's not a direct quote, but it is all <laughs> things like that. Is it me? Maybe. Yeah, he's just fucking with this guy. Yeah, hundred percent. And and I th- I I I can't guarantee that I wouldn't do the same. Yeah, for sure. Love it. That's a no from me. All right, moving on. Let's talk about Dwayne Weber. How do you feel about Dwayne Weber? Why not? This is a World War II Army vet. He spent time in. Six different prisons between 1945 and 68 for forgery and burglary. Okay. But in 1971, he was a free man. Um, The only reason I bring Dwayne Weber up, the only reason anyone has brought him up, is that three days before his 1995 death, he said to his wife, I am Dan Cooper. I am Dan Cooper. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. She didn't think anything of it. She'd never heard the name before in her life. Oh, awkward. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then he died. Uh, I, I'm going to make a um, a promise now that on my deathbed, I'm going to say some like wild shit to you. Just say, I am Dan Cooper. <laughs> I shot JFK. What? <laughs> and then I just die. So a friend of hers, um, she mentioned it to a friend if, like after he had died and that friend was like, oh, that, that was the name of the hijacker in, in that, uh, thing. And so she, she went to her local library and got Max Gunther's book, um, D.B. Cooper, What Really Happened, which came out in, I think, 75, mm-hmm. uh, or 85. And, uh, in the copy of the book in the library, there were a bunch of notes in the margins in her husband's handwriting in Aww. pencil. Uh, then she what started. What did the notes say? It didn't. Say, I, I couldn't find any anyone who actually <sighs> gave me that. Just like, just like highlighting sections and and and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, then she started thinking about it and recalled in retrospect some funny things, like how once Dwayne had had a nightmare when he was talking in his sleep about jumping from a plane and <laughs> leaving fingerprints on the aft stairs. Also in bed, he made her call him Dan. <laughs> it's very specific, right? Yeah. Uh, he had told her that an old knee injury he had was, oh, it's from when I jumped out of a plane. Casual. Casually. Uh, he did drink bourbon. He was a chain smoker. Okay. I, I'm not going to count that towards anything in 1971. I'm just not. I think that's fair. I think that's fair, but people do. So I'm just letting <laughs> you know what's here. Oh, he liked bourbon. Yeah, Okay. 
1979, Dwayne and his wife took a trip to the Columbia River, and he took a walk alone um, by the water, by himself, for a couple hours. It was just I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you that whenever I go walking down the beach by myself for an hour or two, I am trying to recover my uh, hijacked money. Or, or scattering money, because <laughs> he took this walk by himself, and then it was four months later that within a few miles of that of that spot on the same river, Brian Ingram found the ransom money. That is very interesting, but I still don't understand why you would go through all of this hijacking and never use the money. Why you just throw it away. Yeah, it's being tracked, but you must have known that that was a f- factor when you started this. I agree with you. We have two more guys to get through. Okay. William J. Smith. Um, this is a pretty recent uh, suspect. In mid-2018, a uh, U.S. Army data analyst was... I don't think this was his job. I think he was just doing some hobby, some nerd hobby stuff. And he sent... <laughs> what are we doing right now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, it's a good point. He worked up a uh, little report, some research report, and sent his findings to the FBI. He um, had basically cross-referenced a bunch of little D.B. Cooper things, right? Mm-hmm. D- data analytics. Yeah. And he narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and narrowed till he got to William J. Smith, who was a World War II Navy vet who Mm -hmm. was 43 years old at the time of the hijacking. After the Navy, Smith worked for the Lehigh Valley Railroad, and he lost his whole pension uh, when its parent company went bankrupt in 1970. And people said this embittered him to the transportation industry. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. In his high school yearbook, an Ira Daniel Cooper is listed among his class alumni who were killed in World War II. Hmm. So maybe he did a a, a Dick Whitman. Oh, little Dicky Wits. Little Dick Whitman and uh, uh, grabbed that name. He okay. he also. I'm actually gonna this guy. I'm gonna pull up for you, so you can see him. Well, that's interesting. So like his face is genuinely pretty similar, even that's, as an old guy. That's pretty damn close. And so wait, he's 51 in 1985 in that picture. 57. Oh. I misread it. Still. Yeah, he still looks pretty old. Doesn't look good. Well, listen, he's been chain smoking and drinking bourbon for for the Just like all of them. (laughs) Okay, well, that that guy is pretty spot on. And when you consider that he is a World War II Navy vet, he was 43 years old at the time, so he's around the right age, uh, the stuff with the railroad, and one of his buddies at the railroad also was a vet, but was an Air Force vet who used to be uh, um, stationed... At the Air Force Base, just down the road from uh, um, Seattle-Tacoma Airport. Remember the one that D.B. Cooper said, uh, oh yeah, it's just a 20-minute drive from here. So how did this hobbyist find this guy? Like, was he on a really long list of suspects at one point? Um, well, when the FBI was reached out to by the by media outlets about this specific guy, and this is in 2018, they said it would be inappropriate to comment on any specific sus- suspect. So, like, How many years? Is he still alive? Um, no, he died. So comment. That seems awfully cagey for an FBI who would love to solve a classic unsolved case. And now I have I have one left, and this, I don't know which one of these I like. Oh, by the way, where, where are you on these last couple guys? Plausibility meter. <sighs> okay, um, mm-hmm. okay. So Dwayne Weber, he was the one who told his wife. Yep, I am Dan Cooper. And then he took a long walk. He he had a nightmare, and he talked about leaving well, fingerprints he, on the he app could have stairs. had just read the book. Yeah, he could have had it exactly. And exactly, then had a nightmare. The yes, he was having a nightmare where he was D.B. Cooper because he was uh, reading about aft stairs in Max Gunther's book. Yeah. Um, hmm. I'll give that one a four, too. Okay. And how about William J. Smith, this last guy? Uh, the, the photograph guy? Mm-hmm. Oh, I like him a lot. I like him a lot. Read me the last one. And okay. then I, I want to see how I feel about it. Walter R. Reca. Okay. Uh, R-E-C-A. Walt to his friends. Sure. He was a Michigan native. He was a military vet. He served in World War II. He was one of the original members of the Michigan parachute team. Cute. 
And the reason he's on this list is because he allegedly confessed to his best friend, Carl Lauren, on May 17th, 2008. Okay. Was he also on his deathbed or? Uh, No, he died in 2018. He later gave permission in a notarized signed letter. That's interesting. For Lauren to share his story after he died, which he did, sorry, in 2014 at age 80. Uh, In late 2008, Lauren also recorded hours of conversations with Rekka, not secretly, like Rekka knew he was Mm -hmm. recording it, um, and got new details the public hadn't heard. But did the FBI say, oh, yeah, these are the ones that we were holding back? And... No, because the FBI closed the case in 2016, and they have no interest in um, commenting any further. Yeah, but if they were able to solve it, they wouldn't be like, no, you know what? Nah. So here's what Rekka told Lauren. He said that after the jump, he, Rekka, Cooper, had walked for a while. He found a road, and then he walked past a couple of bridges, and he saw some lights, and then eventually he came to a roadside diner. He walked in. It was raining, of course, still, so he's soaking wet. He walks in, he sat next to a man in a cowboy hat who uh, drove a dump truck, he said, and um, asked him for directions, uh, well, asked him to give directions to Rekka's accomplice. He said, hey, he sat. He sits down next to this guy and basically goes, hey, if I call my friend, could you um, give him directions to get here? Mm-hmm. The guy was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, he probably figuring the guy who's in a car accident or has a flat or something. Right. So um, the guy gives the friend directions and uh, uh, Rekka offers to pay for his coffee. The guy says, no, thanks. Uh, you're fine. And then uh, and then Rekka leaves. That's what he claims. So Lauren, he wants to get to the bottom of this, right? So he um, going back to the FBI's search zone, it probably was wrong. Mm-hmm. another Northwest flight came through that same area not too long after. And based on what they reported the wind as, um, a bunch of uh, aviation experts think Cooper would have been like pretty far south, southwest of where the FBI was looking originally. Mm-hmm. And this guy, Lauren, uh, agreed with, with that kind of... Uh, he he's Lauren also uh, has a history and career in aviation, so he, he kind of believed that. And he uh, figured the most likely drop zone was near Clay Elam, Washington. Okay. C-L-E-E-L-U-M. And so he used that, the landmarks that Rekka had mentioned in his stories, and a map. This is really cool detective work, <laughs> work stuff, if it's not bullshit. Uh, and he went looking for the dump truck cowboy. Whoa, I, I thought he was going to look for the diner. Well, he did. But that's a very specific guy to find. He found the diner, he asked about the dump truck cowboy, and he found him. Some guy that just was there People 40 years ago? People at the diner ago? were able to point, oh, the guy with the with the, the guy who always wears the cowboy stuff, and he used to, yeah, yeah, that's Jeff. <laughs> They're very lucky that he's a regular. Oh, you're talking about Jeff? Okay. So he was sent to Jeff Osiadak, Osiadax. O-S-I-A-D-A-C-Z. Osiadach? Yeah, sure. Uh, anyway, Jeff uh, said, oh, shit, yeah, I remember that guy. Yeah, I, I figured he had a car accident. He looked like a drowned rat. The only part of that that's in quotes is looked like a drowned rat, by the way. He did say that about Cooper. And the guy basically confirmed that story. Yeah, yeah, exactly that happened, that happened to me. Um, well... And On its face, this seems very interesting, but it's also like, would you really remember someone asking you for directions 40 years ago? I, I agree. And uh, wait, hold on. Okay. Also, Rekka also said he had used the money on large purchases. So uh, buying furniture, buying a car, down payment on a house. Mm-hmm. And that's all businesses who are used to dealing with large cash transactions. And they're not going to be thumbing through every one of those bills, right? They, they, they if, uh, if you're a mortgage broker, you're mm-hmm. handed uh, big stacks of cash all the time, especially in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, but if they have to take it to a bank, the banks have the serial numbers. Yeah, it's very true. So I that that's where we've run into problems again, and I don't disagree with you. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, when Lauren uh, came out with all this stuff, he held a whole press conference, and sitting next to him, hanging next to him, was uh, Walter Recca's long underwear. 
which he claimed <laughs> Cooper was wearing uh, during the hijacking. Okay. And he did this. He gay talked about all his findings and how he was yes selling a book, and um, yeah. So so that that's um th- that's the last um suspect we have here is Walter Recca. And and yeah, I'm with you. This has the same problem to me as the Rackstraw thing, which is this all works if Carl Lauren is telling the truth. Right. But if Carl Lauren... I mean, I assume the dump truck cowboy is on the record. He is. But... uh, I don't know. I think that's just such a specific thing to remember from so long ago. If nothing weird happened. If you didn't realize later, oh, it was D.B. Cooper. You know, like... If I was in a diner and some... I probably wouldn't talk to some random guy. So some lady came up to me and said, can you... um, and nowadays, text my friends these directions to get here. Sure. Da, da 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 Can I buy you your coffee? No, that's okay, ma'am. Have a good day. That could have literally happened last week to me. I don't remember. Like, this guy remembers that, that kind of thing happening decades ago? Well, remember, this is a guy he saw. He said he saw him. Jeff, that is. Uh, saw... I, 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 I mean, all... maybe Jeff has an amazing memory. It's just hard for me to believe. Well, Jeff said he saw Walter walking down the road. Saw Dan Cooper, right, walking down the road when Jeff, like Jeff, drove past him on his way to the diner. Mm-hmm. Didn't stop for him. Figured that looks like a guy who needs a ride, but didn't have any room in the truck, so he just, you know, uh, continued on. And then the guy shows up at the diner. So I, I could see it being a thing that left an impression because it's this guy walking out in the rain, totally soaked, yes, and then you such helped a him. Long time. Yeah. No. I and and it's definitely. And it's, it's, if you thought it was innocuous at the time, like what is going to make your brain say this is important? Remember this. Yeah, and it's also, you know, just as easy for me to believe that maybe. This guy, Carl, just found this guy, Jeff, and said, what if I paid you to say that I found you and told you this story? And you were like, yeah. Yeah. It's so tempting. But it's. It's like when someone tells a lie and they add a lot of details Mm -hmm. and it makes it more suspicious because no one really remembers all those details or and things like that. I, I know exactly what you mean. I that's, have the same that's impulse. That's the when feel I that I have. So I'm not sure. I like the last guy better. Uh, interesting. I it, think because uh, there's less witnesses, but like the witnesses in this case, it's like I don't know. It, it's it's so much detail, so much backup from so f- so long ago, mm-hmm. and I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. But unfortunately. It's the best we have to go on because there's really no physical evidence in this case. And Uh, again, it should be making me say, that's the guy. I mean, there's witnesses. There's all this stuff. But I don't know. And there hasn't been any new evidence in this case uh, in in quite a while. Or has there? Because last year, (laughs) your boy, Thomas Colbert. Oh, that's not my not my boy. Your boy. Not my boy. Some of his 40 person staff. Uh, was digging in an undisclosed location yeah, in they Oregon. they have to do something to warrant their paycheck. They won't say where their search area is, but they're searching an area of the woods, have been for years, and they have found a, a little strap and a piece of a parachute that they claim belong to Dan Cooper, a.k.a. Oh, have they given that Robert to the Rackstra. FBI? Oh, no. They think the FBI will, will bungle it. Okay. They also won't tell anyone where they found it. Because they say that it's, you know, they want to keep their investigation tight. I hate it. Yeah, they're not great. No. Anyway, that's uh, D.B. Cooper. Would you like to know what I think? Absolutely. Unfortunately, I kind of would tend to agree with the FBI's guess, which seems to be this guy died. Yeah, that's that's my thought, too. I mean, there are people that I like better than others when it comes to suspects. Um, I still think the idea of it being an inside job is fun. Yes. And actually explains a lot, mm-hmm. um, which those kinds of conspiracies or whatever don't usually explain more. It usually just asks more questions. Um but yeah, I mean, I'm, I just keep getting hung up on, and maybe you answered this when you said it was 
uh, big purchases that people don't check the serial numbers. But again, the banks all had the serial numbers. You'd think they'd be checking for at least a few years. So if you if you're not very patient, um, it's just I keep getting hung up on the fact that none of the money was ever found except in the water, which makes me think the parachute had a problem or he had a problem jumping out. Um, could have even had a landing problem. Parachute was fine, but he crashed into a friggin forest and he hasn't been found because the forest is very dense and uh, I don't know. I, th- I think I think he probably died, and that's why he never got to spend the money. Some of those FBI uh, analysts said um, he they figured he probably didn't even get his chute open um, in that kind of conditions. Well, that's what I was saying. Like, can you even manage? Did they ever, and this is just like a wild thing, but did they ever check on like people, like men with that? I'm sure they did. Um, men with that description, that age range maybe even that area going missing around that time? Yes, they did specifically look for that. And um, they didn't, A, they didn't find any. Uh, and B... Well, that's also weird. It is very weird. Unless he's from a different area. Right. Or and, Canada or something. And they were also looking for... Well, remember some of these suspects we just went over are from all over the country. Right. And we don't know where he is before he's in the Portland airport. Exactly. He could have gotten off another plane. Right. So, I mean, did they only check disappearances in that area? Did they check all over the country, all over the North American? Here's what I keep thinking about, too. With that story that he had like a like two guys waiting on the ground and then they drove him to a Cessna that was waiting to fly away. Uh, He had a planned drop zone that he only missed by like a thousand feet or something. Mm -hmm. How is that possible? In a lot of ways, a lot of this crime is like a magic trick. Um, and I don't mean just because it seems impossible. But in order for him to actually have had a planned drop zone that he landed close to... Everything would have had to gone perfect. And he would have to... Remember, the flight crew was the flight was only on its way to Reno because he wanted to go to Mexico City. And they said, well, no, we have to make a refueling stop. Yeah, so like unless you're like doubling back and like knowing that that would happen and you really want reno right and also you have to assume that nothing else is going to go wrong Mm -hmm. you know that you're not going to make have to make any other changes right which seems it seems like you can't plan much ahead in this sort of thing you could plan the actual hijacking you can plan it up even through jumping out, but you're going to have to be flexible as to where you're going to land. Mm-hmm. Now, um, people have argued whether that jump was suicidal or not, the way the FBI has kind of uh, painted it. Uh, people have pointed out that U.S. Special Forces will make jumps into um, uh, you know conditions like that. They've pointed out that even some of the uh, D-Day jumps were um, into similar conditions. Oh, God, don't remind me. And there were... Uh, and that sounds like I was in D-Day. Now we just watched Band of Brothers for the first time. It was very traumatizing. First time for Carrie, very traumatizing <laughs> for someone who hates flight. Yes. Um, yeah, so maybe it was uh, suicidal, maybe it wasn't. But I would tend to think that most of that money has dissolved at the bottom of oh, absolutely. the river. Yeah. I don't know. My gut reaction is that he died somehow jumping out or landing um, and he just hasn't been recovered because wherever he was was super dense forest. And by the time anyone would be anywhere near there, uh, most of the proof has vanished, you know, and gone down the river. That's right. And for those reasons, it is likely that, well, um, you can have your thoughts. You can, uh, we obviously have ours, mm-hmm. uh, but the truth of what happened after Dan Cooper sent uh, sent that flight attendant into that uh, uh, cabin. Did they ever... No one will ever know except Dan Cooper, and he is likely dead. If not on that day, then, then you know, right. I know. he'd did be they, old. Did they ever investigate if he was a ghost? You know, I don't... Th- I'd never read anything about that, but... I think I solved it. That would have been a good angle. Mm-hmm. You mean because he's incorporeal? Mysterious and... Oh, just because he's mysterious? Yeah, and everything mysterious is a ghost. Oh, I thought you meant it would make the hijacking easier if he was a a ghost. Well, it would make a lot of things easier to be a ghost. 
walking through walls, for instance. I think it's time to take a break. <laughs> I'm tired. We'll be back with some news. <laughs> Watch out, it's Lizard People Big World. 2020 has been a year of conspiracy theories, and this is only the latest. Donald Trump, the so-called President of, U of the United States, announced on Friday, October 2nd, that himself and Melania had tested positive for coronavirus. Oh, I didn't. I hadn't heard that. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't been anywhere in the news, weirdly. You'd think they would have made the headlines. <laughs> He likely contracted the illness sometime around Wednesday when he held a 45-minute rally in Minnesota where close advisor Hope Hicks began to exhibit symptoms of the virus. Despite being isolated at the back of Air Force One, it seems most, if not all, of the plane travelers got sick soon after. Trump was taken to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center where he received oxygen, an experimental antibody cocktail, antiviral drug remdesivir, the steroid dexmethasone, and his usual drugs to beat his uh, heart disease. Yeah, but Carrie, these are all facts. Where's the conspiracy theory? I'm coming, I'm coming. On Sunday, Trump ventured out of the hospital in a little parade to wave at the crowd, likely infecting everyone in the car with him. But whatever. Monday, he was released from Walter Reed, possibly so he can go home to the White House and continue to infect people there. So what's the conspiracy theory here? Well, many people are starting to chatter that Trump never had COVID at all. From Twitter to documentarian Michael Moore, many people have started to float the theory that Trump faked sick, just like Ferris Bueller, but much, much less charming. QAnon followers, who deserve an episode all their own explaining how problematic they are, have spread the insane concept that COVID-19 is a hoax designed to deflect attention from a Satan-worshipping pedophile ring operated by Hillary Clinton and liberal elites. Well, yeah, again, those are facts. Where's the conspiracy theory? <laughs> You're an idiot. Trump, their reasoning goes, is pretending to have COVID-19 as part of a grand plan to arrest Clinton. I don't know how that works but what how how is the trap sprung exactly i i have no idea i didn't want to delve too deep into q and on twitter it seemed like a point of no return these thoughts would be easy to like mock and ignore but keep in mind that according to the guardian 24 candidates running for congress in november with 22 as republicans and two as independents have endorsed or promoted q and on content and several of those are almost guaranteed to win their districts. So, but let's work this out. Like, how does the um, how does this master plan work? Okay, so the president has coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Question marks. Profit. <laughs> arrest Hillary Clinton. I'm not sure how it leads to arrest Hillary Clinton. There are other conspiracy theories that say that he did this to deflect from his bad. Press week after the first debate, and possibly only debate, um, or get some sort of sympathy going for him that will turn up votes in the election, question mark? I'm not sure. Um, but as with any strategy with him, it's, it's really just a crapshoot. So I could believe that he would do something like that. I could believe that he really had it and it was just acting rash and foolish that's the one i buy i i don't see how it helps him to have had this virus uh that, that uh he, he seems to keep implying is not a big deal yeah but but, I, but he went directly back to the white house and kept on implying it's not a big deal because he did great well but right after he was elected uh his doctor with the funny hair told us he's the healthiest person he's ever worked on so maybe you know. yeah that's um that was a lie uh, and I think the doctor has said that it, that was basically dictated to him. So, again, who knows what to believe? Uh, Michael Moore of Fahrenheit 9-11 fame posted, Why on earth would we believe him today? Has he earned your trust now? So I guess we'll have to hold tight and see what happens. Um, but at the end of the day, who who knows what to believe anymore? Uh, any of this could be plausible at this point, except the whole QAnon, Satan worshiping i don't even know how that works out it's just stupid <laughs> yeah i mean I, I understand why people would assume he's lying about this because 
he lies like he draws breath, the president. Uh, well, right now he's struggling to do even that. So maybe the lying will uh, also suffer. Oh, get on Twitter. He, he Dropping oxygen levels didn't uh, stop him from, from lying. No, but you can see him visibly struggling through his little one one minute, one minute, 30 second speech that he just did. So that's fun. Yeah. That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on iTunes. We'll be forever grateful. See you next Tuesday. Yep. Uh, This show was created by Sean McCabe and Carrie Ferrante. Music by Kyle Ryan. This has been a production of Longboy Media. (laughs) 